Okay, tonight's Torah portion by it, which in Hebrew, which in English is, and he left. So I have an extra Hebrew word for us tonight, and by the way, the Torah portion is Genesis chapter 28, 10 to 32, verse 2. Um, the bulletin says verse 3, but that's not correct. It's verse 2 of chapter 32 brings an end to tonight's Torah portion. I have an added Hebrew word. The added Hebrew word is machanaim. Machanaim is simply camps. Often people sort of argue that it means two camps. That's not what the Hebrew gives us. The Hebrew gives us machanaim, and it comes from the Hebrew word machane, which is camp or, or camp of an army. So whenever you have a, a im at the end of a Hebrew word, it means that it's plural, right? So machane is the Hebrew word for an army, like a camp of an army. Not, not just any camp, but an army's camp. So machane and machaneum, of course, is plural for armies' camps. People say, well, it means two camps, and no. And I'll, I'll illustrate for you in a few moments why people say it means two camps, and it does not. It's simply, again, plural for machane. All right. So, by the way, it's used, machane is used 187 times for an army's camp. Of course, in this context, it's referring to God's army, right? His angels. And so we'll talk about that a little more in a few moments. I have three points of interest. Of course, I do my best to give you, give you three points of interest. Most of the Torah portions are so replete with teachable material that I can give you four or five points of interest if you would stay all night, but you won't. Some of you leave before I begin. So why give more than three points? So three points of interest. So the first point of interest is Jacob or Yahakov. What does Yahakov mean again? In the Aramean tongue, Yahakov, the, the name Yahakov is not really Hebrew, it's Aramean. In the Aramean tongue, Yahakov means supplant, a supplanter, supplant. So Yahakov attempts to Aramean God, and we'll see that tonight. He attempts to Aramean God. You know, sometimes we say people will Jew you down, I don't like that too much. Yeah. Whenever, whenever someone makes a statement like that, what are they saying? A Jewish person is going to battle with you. He's going, to, he's going to do his best to get as much out of you as he can, right, in business. Someone tries to Jew you down. Well, that element that exists in the people of Israel is actually the Aramean element, their history as the people of Aram. That, that's where it comes from. It doesn't come from Judah. Judah was far from anything like that. Judah was, Judah was, in fact, what we see of Judah, and we'll see this in exactly two weeks. Judah was upright, incredibly upright before God, a, tra a, a transformed person. You don't see anything of an Aramean in Judah, but you see that in Jacob, right? And tonight, actually, next week, is when we'll see the end of the Aramean in Jacob. Why? Because he's completely transformed. So people say, you know, someone tried to Jew me down. They should say someone tried to Aramean me down or Aram me down or something like that. But Jacob attempts to Aramean God. We'll see that tonight. Second point of interest is from a guided life to a yielded life. And this is, I think, the most, the most profound takeaway from the story of Jacob and his, his, his revelations, his development, and his coming to the land. From a guided life to a yielded life. We'll talk about that. Jacob's encounter, we're going to talk also about Jacob's encounter at Mahaniam. Mahaniam, Mahaniam. Very important, very important uh, event that occurred in Jacob's life when he came to Mahaniam and encountered God's camp. And that's how he identifies it, as God's camp. Not, not, not plural, but singular. He says, this is God's camp, but we'll go on to that. So Jacob, uh, let's talk about the first point of interest, Jacob's attempt to Aramean God. Let's go to Genesis chapter 28. In Genesis chapter 28 is where the story begins. We're going to read uh, 10 to 22, and if I can get to it, I didn't mark it. Gen Genesis chapter 28. All right, here we go. 10 to 22, let's read. So again, this is the story of Jacob. This is from last week's Torah portion. We know what happened. Jacob uh, and his mom, Rebecca, attempted to Aramean. In fact, they did a really good job at Arameanin uh, Isaac. 
and Esau, right? Esau, we talked a lot about Esau last week and how Esau, uh, he, he, got a, he got a bad deal. There's no question about it. He got a bad deal. Uh, did he deserve it? No. Did he deserve the birthright and the double portion? No, because it wasn't for him. But he didn't deserve what he got. <laughs> he got a raw deal. He, he got Aramean, for sure. So we talked about that quite a bit last week, and now we're going to talk about Jacob and, and where he goes from that point. So verse 10 to 22, uh, Genesis chapter 28. Then Jacob departed from Beersheba and went towards Haran. He came to a certain place and spent the night there because the sun had set, and he took one of the stones of the place, yes, one of the stones of the place, and put it under his head and lay down in that place. So he grabbed a stone and made a pillow with it. How does that sound to you? Ooh, right? Mr. Pillow, they can use a little bit of Mr. Pillow there, but obviously they didn't just sleep on a raw stone. What they would do, and even up to, you know, 100 years ago, and in fact, if you're lost in the wilderness and you have a backpack with some clothes and blankets and stuff, you're not going to put your head on a raw, on, a, on a, a rock, would you? You would put something between you and the rock, and that's what... That's what you typically do. The, the rock, the pillow just supports your head so you don't twist your neck. Anyway, so he, he grabs a stone from the place. And this is relevant because you're gonna see, you'll see him reacting to God's word in a certain way that involves the same stone. So he takes that stone. He has a dream, right? We know the story. We're going to see this here in a, in a moment. He had a dream on that stone. So suddenly, this, suddenly the stone becomes very important. This is where Jacob is, right? Keep in mind that Jacob is very much a pagan. He's very much a pagan. His grandfather, Abraham, is not a pagan. His father, Isaac, was not a pagan. But Jacob is, he is sort of a, a, a mesh, a blend of all the different belief systems. And that comes out of him, for sure. But you begin to see that in him tonight. That yes, his, 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 his knowledge and his worship of the one true God was tainted with pagan practice. So he takes a stone, he has a dream on that stone, and he's going to build a, a pillar on that stone. So let's read. And they said that he had a dream. And behold, a ladder was set up on the earth with its top reaching to heaven. And behold, the angels of God were ascending and descending on it. And behold, the Lord stood above it and said... I am the Lord, the God of your father Abraham, and the God of your father Isaac. Isaac, the land on which you, you lie, I will give it to you and to your descendants. So, he sees a ladder. It's top going to heaven. The Lord stood at the top of the ladder and spoke to him. That's what it says here. The Lord st stood at the top of the ladder, spoke to him. Angels were ascending and descending upon that ladder. We know from Jesus' conversation with Nathaniel, some 2,000 years later in the Galilee, that Jesus is that ladder. He said to Nathaniel, are you amazed because I knew what you were thinking? I'm paraphrasing. He says, what would you say if you saw angels ascending and descending upon the Son of Man? And of course, the, the, the essence there is, of course, that he is that ladder. So what does the ladder represent? Jesus is the connection between heaven and hell. Oh, excuse me, heaven and earth. He is the connection between heaven and hell. That's a different message. <laughs> but he is the connection between heaven and earth. He is what conjoins heaven and earth. And that's the point of the ladder. The, the angels were ascending and descending upon it. Now, that ladder was not being used by any persons, any man, right? No. Angels, the messengers, God's messengers, were up and down on that ladder. And Jesus said, what would you, to Nathaniel, what would you say? if you saw angels ascending and descending upon me. The point is, he's the word of God. The messengers, the angels, are, are being charged by him, obviously, and they ascend and descend on him. He is, he is in authority over God's word. He is the word of God. Clearly, that's what, that's what is being portrayed here. A connection between heaven and earth, and who stood at the top of the ladder? The word of God. What was happening with the ladder? Angels, up and down. Messengers, up and down on that ladder. So the ladder represents Yeshua, or we can say his ministry. Could we say that? His ministry. 
in a very real way, when we come together to worship, or when there's real worship occurring anywhere, praise and worship, that ladder is set up right there in the midst of the worship, because he is that ladder. Jesus is manifest as believers in him begin to worship him. He takes his place in that body of people. That ladder is here. Jacob's ladder is here whenever that happens. Your descendants will also be like the dust of the earth, and you will spread out on the west and on the east and to the north and to the south, and in you and in your descendants, all the families of the earth will be blessed. Does that promise remind us of anything? Yes. What God said to Abraham and what he also said to Isaac. So what's happening here is the promises given to Abraham and Isaac are being extended to Jacob. But Jacob has to go through a certain process. That Aramean pagan in him has to be dispelled, has to be removed. And that's part of this displacement process. He's being displaced from the land of Israel in order for that Aramean to be dispelled. Okay, God never wanted Abraham to leave the land, right? In fact, whenever Abraham went out, he got himself in trouble. When Isaac was about to go out from Gerar, remember we read that? He was about to go to Egypt, leave the land. God said, no, stay here in Gerar. And he stayed. God never wanted Jacob to leave the land. Jacob is leaving the land because of his lack of faith. Because of his Arameanism. He's leaving the land. He's being expelled. Basically, he's being expelled. Behold, I am with you, and I will keep you wherever you go, and I will bring you back to this land, for I will not leave you until I have done what I have, pro what I have promised you. Then, so that's, that's a promise. What, what an incredible promise. Again, it's in perfect alignment with what God promised to Abraham and what he promised to Isaac. The only difference here is that God gives him a vision. We don't see that real clearly with Ab anything like that with Abraham and Isaac. And the vision is Yeshua, the ladder, the one who is the word of God, who has the responsibility for the delivering of the word of God. So why do you think he had that vision, do you think? He certainly didn't understand the vision. He never brings it up again. The, the, next, the next time we see anything about a ladder... A connection between heaven and earth is when Jesus himself identified himself to be that ladder. So why did he have that vision? If you know, wonderful, I don't have an idea. I don't really know why God uh, took that step to give him that particular vision. We can guess, but maybe there is revelation there for us, and maybe one of you might pick that up, but I just don't know what's the significance of why he had that particular vision of Yeshua being that ladder stood at the top of it. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, Surely the Lord is in this place. And I didn't know it. So we're, we're, he's referring here to Bethel, right? What we're going to see is that suddenly Bethel becomes a holy place. That's something uniquely holy about Bethel. What's at Bethel today? Is God's house there? No, there's nothing there but a barren piece of rock. But he has this vision on that spot, that location. And he determines now that that spot is holy. It really wasn't holy. His experience was. It was for his benefit. Let's read. He was afraid and said, <laughs> he's, af he's afraid. He was afraid and said, how awesome is this place. It's none other than the house of God, and this is the gate of heaven. So what was the basis of him coming to that conclusion? His fear. He was afraid. He was gripped by the experience and decided that he was going to establish this place as God's house. The place of God's presence. The gate of heaven. Was it truly the gate of heaven? No. The gate of heaven was about eight miles, it is in fact, and was about eight miles southeast of Bethel. Namely, Yerushalayim. So you see, Jacob is sort of grabbing at, 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 at possibilities. He's, he's not in a position of faith. He does not have true understanding. And he's just grabbing at things. So Jacob rose early in the morning and took the stone that he had put under his head and set it up as a pillar and poured oil on its top. So here is Jacob doing a very religious thing, a very pagan thing. He's building a pillar. 
In the ancient, in the ancient Semitic world, what did a pillar represent? It was a phallic symbol. The pillar was Baal. That's what the pillar represented in the ancient world. They didn't build a pillar to, to honor the God of Israel, the El. That, no, that was, <laughs> he wouldn't have had it. Pillars were built to honor Baal. So he builds a pillar. He pours holy oil on it. The spot is holy. The stone is holy. And now he's going to make a deal with God. Now he's going to Aramean God. You see the convolution of his, of his spirituality here? You, see, you can see how convoluted he is. He, he's not purely considering the God of Israel, the God of his father, Isaac. What we're going to see tonight is that he had a fear. Actually, yes, tonight's portion. He had a fear of the God of Isaac because of Isaac's faith and commitment to that God. So you see, he did not have a true relationship with the God of Isaac and the God of Abraham. He considered the fear of Isaac, which is correlated perfectly with the faith that Isaac had in the God of Israel. So Jacob is far removed from the God of Israel, as far as you can possibly be, perhaps. So now he takes the stone that he had that dream on. The stone is holy, obviously. The place is holy. He builds a pillar, puts some oil in it. Now the pillar is holy. And now he's preparing to do a holy trans transaction with God. And he called the name of the place Bethel. However, previously the name of the place had been Luz. In other words, it's Luz. Then Jacob made a vow. Should Jacob have, have made a vow at this point? Who made vows? The pagans did. And Jacob made a vow saying, if, that's how he begins his vow, if, poor adventure, if God will be with me and will keep me on this journey that I take and will give me food, and food to eat and garments to wear and I return to, I return to my father's house in safety, then the Lord will be my God. So what is he, what is he doing here? He's striking a deal with God. He's basically saying, prove to me that you're God. Take me out there. Take care of me. Provide everything I need from food to clothes. Bless me and cause me to return here. Then you would be my God. That's where Jacob is. Jacob is not anything like his father Isaac. He's not anything like his father Abraham, his grandfather Abraham. He is totally in the flesh. He's an Aramean. 100%. This stone which I set up as a pillar will be God's house. And of all that you give me, I will surely give a tenth, a tenth of it I will tie to you. So he's 100% religious. He's making vows. He's saying, if you do this, God, you will be my God. In other words, if you bless me, God, I'll go to church on Sunday morning. Yeah. If I like the message of the preacher, if I like the worship, then, then I'll be at that church. If not, then, then, then I'm not going to be there. No faith. No ground in, in the, the reality of biblical faith. If. Once you begin your, your discussion with God with an if, you're completely Jacob. That, completely Jacob. I've seen so many people come in and out of this place, and, their, and their, 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 their decision to be here or to serve God is based on an if. And they never come to fruition. They never come to a place of fruitfulness. When I first came here, I had no ifs. What I had was, I will. Regardless of whatever occurs, I will. And not if. If is for the unbeliever. I will is a determination that comes from faith. And that's what Jacob didn't have at this point. Keep in mind... God's going to take him away from a, a guided life, and he is guided. Is he guided? God is guiding him. God's going to take him away from a guided life and bring him into a life of being yielded to God, where it's not if but yes. So, so this is important. Some of us really need to hear this. So God was tolerant of Jacob at this time. You're building up. Baal, a pillar. You're pouring holy oil on this pillar. It's a libation is what he was doing. If you know anything about paganism, again, I grew up in a Hindu community, seven years of it. I witnessed it 
Never practiced it, but I saw what they did. And this is precisely what they did. They took stones, and they, they, they believed that the presence of God, or the presence of the, the demon God, was in that stone. And they would put oil on it, they would do a libation, and, and, and make promises, or whatever they do. It's paganism. And this is what Jacob is doing with the God of Israel. And God is tolerant with him. God wasn't taken by surprise here. <laughs> Jacob would build him a Baal. Again, what is a Baal? It's a phallic symbol. That Jacob did this thing. And God was gracious. The proof of God's graciousness, isn't it? So now, Jacob, now let's, let's look at that second point of interest. From a guided life to a yielded life. We know that Jacob was guided by God, right? Uh, many times we hear people talking about the guided life. In fact, Jeremy, our rabbi friend in Israel, he talks about a guided life. And that's in terms of faith. Knowing that God is guiding you and that God is at the helm of your ship, so to speak. And every step that you take is being guided by God. And this is true. But many, many times a guided life does not necessarily mean that your life is yielded. You follow me. Someone can be absolutely chosen of God, anointed, appointed by God, and being guided by God, but never come to a place of being yielded. And this is precisely where Jacob is. He's not yielded in any way at all. I mean, really, he's building pillars to God. He's trying to, he's trying to Aramean God. The big if, again. So he's not yielded, but he's guided. And you see, many, many times, it's tough for us to distinguish between the two. And I thought about that today, and I said, you know, why is it, why is it so difficult? I see this in many people. Why is it, why, and I see that tendency myself. Why is it so difficult to be someone guided, but also yielded at the same time? Because I've encountered many people who are guided by God, but they, they, they struggle to come to a place of being fully yielded. Why is that? And I thought about that today. And what do you think? Let, let, me, let me throw that out there for you, since we're all friends. Why do you think it's so difficult in many people's lives to be guided by God, to have that reality of God's direction in their lives, but never come to a place of yielding to God? We're going to see that in Jacob tonight. In fact, we're already seeing it, that he will come to a place of being yielded. But why? Anyone? Huh? Yes, and that's certainly what's happening in Yaakov. But more specifically, why? What, what's the dynamic? Uh, pride? Yeah, but pride comes from a place of fear. Remember, he's afraid. He's afraid. He's being sent out. He's being kicked out of, of his land. His anxiety level must have been off the charts. He has this dream. He's afraid. That's the first thing that hits him, fear. Takes the rock and he wants to appease God. And so, so yeah, pride and fear, they go hand in hand. But what's happening? I'm speaking now of people, not just Jacob. What happens if you've ever encountered someone who is guided, you know that God's hand is in their lives and they are tempting to walk by faith, but you see them sputtering and struggling and usually that's happening because they're not yielded to God. What's that all about? Oh, let me ask this. How many of us have encountered someone like that? Ah, not many of us. Well, I want to tell you this. That is a reality. Why does it exist? Well, I want to submit to you that the blame for its existence, the reason for its existence, is bad Christian doctrine. Just bad Christian doctrine. I'm talking about Christian doctrine from orthodoxy all the way to the prosperity message movement. That whole, that whole span, that whole gamut of bad Christianity, bad doctrine, is why such a thing would be. Because we're not being told, we're not being preached to, we're not being, we're not being taught that we actually have to obey God. We have to do His will. And He has a will for our lives. Especially if you're called, if he's leading you, if he's guiding you, he wants obedience from you. And that's one of the reasons. It also exists because 
We don't know how to be obedient because we've never, again, this is the first reason, we've never been truly conditioned or discipled in the way of obedience. We believe that we can do whatever we want. Go here, go there, do that, decide this. Do this with your life. Don't do this with your life. We are driven by ourselves. And we're told that that's okay. Again, from orthodoxy to the prosperity message. It's all throughout that whole span that I'm, that I'm referring to. No. When we become yielded to God is when we begin to obey Him. If you love me, obey me. Keep my word, but obey me. John chapter 14, it's very vivid. So, so I would recommend to anyone, if this is striking at you this t tonight, I would recommend that you truly learn to hear God's voice and listen for his voice. Develop, foster that most important reality that you hear from him. There's this idea that, oh, you're not supposed to hear from God. God doesn't talk to you. No, that's not true. God speaks to each human being. He wants us to develop this reality of interaction. He wants to have conversations with us. It's true. Now, obvious, obviously, some of us, we go off on a wild Pentecostal binge, and we believe that we're talking to God, and I'm talking for God, I'm speaking for God. Usually... <laughs> Let me say this. You know very well that I don't get up very often and say, thus says the Lord to you. I very rare I do it. And when I do it, I want it to be real. I want it to be, to be grounded. And when I do it, it is. But God speaks to me about my own development, my own responsibilities, my own opportunities. God speaks to me concerning those three things on a daily basis. He also corrects me when I'm wrong. This happens to me every day, sometimes multiple times a day. So I'm telling you that I hear from God regularly. And we all do. We just need to know how to foster that. It's important. It is what it is to live a guided life but a yielded life. So it's not enough to know that God is guiding you, that you, he wants you to trust his word. That's good, but it's not enough. You have to hear and obey. Who are my brothers and my sisters? Those who hear and obey. So you, you guys, some of you know that I'm at the beach. I'm at the beach, I'm here. But I'm really at the beach. I'm going to head back over there tonight until Monday. I was there since last... When? Last Sunday. So I don't take many vacations, but I took sort of a quasi-vacation. wasn't a vacation at all. <laughs> I took a quasi-vacation. The last vacation I had was 2016. That's the last real vacation I had. When I go to Israel, it's not a vacation. When I go to the beach from time to time, maybe one or two days might actually be a vacation. So I'm at the beach here uh, last Sunday night. We got over there. Friends of mine, mine and Lisa from, uh, from Bradenton came over on Sunday, and they want to spend the night and leave on Monday. So these are friends of Lisa, and I'm, I'm, I'm drawing this into, into a focus here as it relates to hearing and obeying the, the yielded life and so on. So this friend of mine's and Lisa's, her name is, his, her name is Susie. Husband's name is Mike. So Susie and Mike met us over at the condo, and of course we were going to go grab a bite, so we went out to this really nice pizza place, Sicilian, real Sicilian. The guys speak with an accent, they watch soccer on the TV, it's all Sicilian, true Italians, and the pizza is good. So we went to this place and we're having this, 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 this dinner, and suddenly it occurred to me that I'm not on a vacation at all. Because all of a sudden I'm dealing with issues of faith, spiritual warfare, I'm rebuking spirits, I'm speaking to wrong Christian ideas, and I'm doing it loudly in this restaurant, and I didn't plan for that at all. I didn't want that, but that's what God had for me. So that went on all night long. We finally left the pizza joint and we went home, well, to the condo. It happened there for about another three and a half hours. And then Saturday, uh, Sunday, Monday morning, I was up. It was happening again. And so clearly by 10 o'clock, I'm saying, okay, this is why I'm here. And so finally it got to me 
Well, the Word of God got clear in my mind concerning what I needed to say to this person. And it was mainly Susie. Because I led her to Jesus. I led her to, 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 to faith about four or five years ago. And so I'm responsible for where she is, in a sense. About two years ago, she, she, we, I led her in regards to the gifts of tongues and so on, the gifts of the Holy Spirit. So, so she's there. But what has happened to Susie is, and I hope she never hears this message, what has happened to Susie is, and you guys don't go looking for her on Facebook and post this message out to her, all right? Don't do it. So, because I'll take about three or four days to try and explain to her what I'm doing right now. Anyway, so I kind of led her and discipled her in regards to many things. Lisa and I had made many trips over to Bradenton to speak with her, to, to work with her. And it finally occurred to me on, on Monday morning that there is zero faith in this person. She's a believer. She goes to a bling bling Pentecostal church. You know what a bling bling Pentecostal church is? That's where she goes. Goes to every preacher's meeting. Always in, in spiritual warfare classes, evangelism classes, praying in tongues. And she's out there. But zero faith. None. It occurred to me that there's a void of hearing and obeying. So that became my emphasis. And I had to drive it home on bo with both of them. Wow, it was, it, was, it was work. Her husband, Mike, at one point turned to me and said, you know the God of the Old Testament, he's not the God of the New Testament. And then he said to me, now hold, hold, your, hold your horses, grab your seats. He said to me, the God of the Old Testament is an SOB. So I looked at Lisa, and I looked at him, and I said, now why am I not punching you all right now? So I took a breath and I said, well, Mike, I must tell you that that's just a bad Christian doctrine. The God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. I want to tell you about Ananias and Sapphira's open Bible. I want to tell you about the church at Thyatira, when Jesus said that he was going to kill the children of Jezebel. And I want to prove to you that the God of the Old Testament is the God of the New Testament. He is Jesus himself. That went on for a long, long time, but the point was, here are believers, particularly Susie, who is filled with the Holy Spirit, who has zero faith. She's not hearing from God at all. She didn't even know that she had to hear from him, really. See, it's easy for us to live a guided life. Is God guiding her life? Yes, he is. Absolutely he is. I'm not sure about Mike. Whew. I'm not sure about him. But I know about Susie. God's guiding her life, but she's absolutely unyielding because she's not hearing and obeying. When we hear and obey, we come into that place of surrender. We come into that place of yielding. And that's where we need to be. And that's where Jacob isn't. He isn't in that place. But, but believe me, he's going to get there. Next week's Torah portion, we're going to see Jacob fully yielded. Fully, all of that pride, all of that, that self is collapsed before God. Destroyed, beaten down. And he's ready to become that, that son of God. That yielded son of God. And that's where this story is going. So, Jacob completely all about himself. Guided? Yes. God is in his life. God showed him a vision of his son being that ladder. No one else has ever seen that vision. No one else. Not even Nathaniel that he spoke to saw that vision. That's a powerful thing. Very guided, very choice and chosen by God was Jacob, but he was nowhere near where he needed to be. So now Jacob becomes this, this slave to Laban. We know the story. I'm not going to get too deep into the story. I think we know the story well, right? He becomes a slave to Laban. What happens? God guides him all the way from Beersheba, to Haran, where he encounters who? Le, Le, uh, Haran, uh, Laban, yes, Laban, yes, but he encounters Rachel. Rachel, he encounters Rachel. And we know the story, right? What happened? He was to marry Rachel. Rachel wanted to marry, they were in love. And what happened? Well, Laban did an Aramean on him. And boy, Laban was a true Aramean, wasn't he? Aramean to the bone, right down to the very core. What did Laban do? He did a switcheroo on him. Instead of, instead of Rachel, he ended up with Leah. Right? 
Leah was the firstborn, and, and the excuse that Laban said is, well, it's not the custom of, of, our, of our community to give you the second. The firstborn is the one that you should, a lie. He's just been an Aramean, right? So what was he doing? He was setting up Jacob to be there for eternity. So seven years go by, and what happens? Doesn't get, he doesn't get Rachel. He gets the maids, Bilha and, and what was the other one? Bilha and Zilcha, right? Those are the two. He ended up with the maids of, of Leah and Rebecca. And he did get Rebecca after 14. He did get, excuse me, Rachel after, after 14 years. It took 14 years. So it's, it's just complete bondage. Uh, he's a slave to Laban, but God is still blessing him and guiding him in the fact that he was blessing him. His favor was upon him. And that was the proof evidence there that he was being guided by God, that God had a purpose for his life, and he was, he was, to, he was to be yielded to it, which he will do. Now, there was, a, there was an incredible story, sort of an interesting story about a mandrake. You know the story about the mandrake, right? Jose is shaking his head. What's the story of the mandrake? Reuben, I guess he, he, he found a mandrake. What's a mandrake? A drake, a meal drake, I guess. He found a mandrake. The mandrake, he brought back to his mother, uh, Leah, and Rebecca, not Rebecca, uh, Rachel, I gotta get this in my mind. Rachel saw the mandrake and said, hmm, I want that. Leah said, no, you want, you want to take my mandrake as well? You took my husband. And Leah, they, there's a back and forth with Leah and Rachel, and finally they made a deal. Finally they did an Aramean. What was the Aramean? Well, Leah from Rachel, I'll let you, sl I'll let you sleep. My night, it's my night to sleep with, with Yaakov. I'll let you sleep with him tonight, and, and you give me the drink. So this, this, this transaction took place. Again, they're all Arameans, right? Think about it. For a drink. And what happens? Leah conceives and she, she gives birth to a boy who is Issachar. This family, this family is dysfunctional even before, before Jacob becomes a family. They're dysfunctional as all get out, right? Dysfunctional. Because that Aramean spirit is strong. Interesting story. Anyway, the story goes on. Finally, it becomes obvious that it's time for Jacob to leave. God is going to guide him away from the place of trouble that he is in. It was God who took him there to begin with. In that place of trouble, God intended to fully bless Jacob. That's how a guided life can glorify God. Guided him to a place of bondage, a place of subjugation, where God would bless him and cause him to prosper. Why? Because he was appointed by God. He was being guided, even though he wasn't yielded. Everything in God's time, right? So now the time comes for him to, to leave, to be guided away back to the land of promise. And we're going to see this tonight. Uh, we're going to see this now in chapter 31, 1 to 3. Now Jacob heard the words of Laban's son, saying, Jacob has taken away all that was our father's and from, all, from what belonged to our father, and he has made all, he has made all this wealth. Jacob saw, that, saw the attitude of Laban, and behold, it was not friendly towards him as formerly. Then the Lord said to Jacob, return to, return to the land of your fathers and to your relatives, and I will be with you. So that's the call back. So God is guiding them now away from Laban, away from, from Haran, and back to the land of Israel. Also, we'll see it here in verse 11 and 13 as well. Then the angel of the Lord said to me in a dream, he's relating this to his wives, Jacob, and I said, here am I. And he said, lift up your eyes and see all that, all that the male goats which are mating are striped, speckled, and mottled. For I have seen all that Laban had, has been doing to you. I am the Lord, I am the, I am the God of Bethel, the God that met you at Bethel where you anointed a pillar, where you made a vow to me, now arise, leave this land, and return to the land of your birth. So he made a pillar, he made a vow. God's going to hold him accountable to his vow and to the reality that he worshipped God, even though he worshipped him in a way that was not, not, not the way that he should have, God is holding him accountable to it. So here we see now God is guiding Jacob back to the land. Now, 
Jacob is not ready. Well, he's almost ready, but he's not quite ready. And that readiness is going to occur in chapter 32. So as he gets ready to go now, he, he takes all of his, his, his possessions, everything that God has blessed him, his wives, his children. How many children did he have at this point? Twelve, including, uh, of course, uh, Dinah. Benjamin wasn't born just yet. So he had 12 children, four wives, well, two wives and two concubines. He had all sorts of flocks, all sorts of riches and blessings, and he's on his way back. Of course, Laban isn't going to let that slip away from him. Jacob and his family was Laban's blessing, uh, 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 investment. Laban invested into Jacob and his daughters, and, and he called his daughters and their children all his. So from his point of view, the returns that Laban was looking for was about was escaping. And so what does Laban do? He, go, he gets up and he goes after his possessions, who is Jacob, his four wives, and his 12 children, and everything he had. And what happens along the way as Laban goes out to meet Jacob, Yaakov? God meets him. And what does God say to him? You're a dead man. <laughs> Don't do it. You see, even that reality is a, is a facet of the guided life. When you live the guided life, you're being guided by God. God will intervene in the lives of others when necessary. He will, he will stop your enemies. He'll push back on your enemies. When you are appointed by God, when you are living that guided life, even though you're not fully yielded. You see, God is bringing Jacob to a certain point. The point where Jacob can respond by faith and become a yielded son of God. And he's not going to allow anything to get in the way. So, Laban's there to, to, to he, wants to he wants to destroy uh, uh, Jacob, who's challenging his investment, and bring everything back home. God says, no, nope, you're not going to do it. You'll die. And so, Laban had to put the brakes on everything. But he still encountered Yaakov and his daughters and all that he thought was his. And he bemoaned everything. He blamed Jacob, and all, all of that happened. They made a deal concerning stones again. They built a pillar of stones again. Very common among the pagans. Uh, and they made a vow never to cross that stone. You, you know the story. We, we don't have to read it. So, Jacob is on his way. Where is he going? He's on his way to the promised land. Along the way now, in conversation with Laban, he makes mention of the fear of Isaac. Maybe we should take a look at that. Jacob is swearing to Laban based on the fear of Isaac. So when he refers to the fear of Isaac, he's, refer he's referring to the incredible faith that Isaac had towards God. And he's going to swear on that because he doesn't have it. He, he, he's, he's clinging to something that his father had that he probably wished wish that he had, but he didn't have it, right? So he's, he's making a vow based on the fear of Isaac. So let's read that. I said we would take a look at that in chapter, chapter 31, verse 53. He's referring out, he's speaking to Laban, and he's referring to, to, to his, his background, I guess. He says, the God of Abraham and the God of Nahor. Who's Nahor? His uncle, Uncle Nahor. The God of Abraham, the God of Nahor, and the God of, of their father uh, judged between us. So Jacob swore by the fear of his father, Isaac. Again, that's, that's based on the fear that Isaac had for God and his response by faith. It tells us that Jacob wanted this. He, he's swearing by it. Soon he'll receive it himself. So he's on his way back, and now we're going to see him now in a place where he will encounter God's camp. The camps of the angels, plural. He's going to encounter God's camp. And this is a pivotal moment in his life. This is when Jacob, Jacob becomes ready to be yielded. Up to that point, he's not yielded. He's basically running. God told him to return. He's, he's responding to God's voice. He's still building pillars, right? He's still practicing 
the, the, relig the religions of the land, of the people. He's building pillars. He built a pillar again with, uh, with, with Laban. But he's running. He's on his way back. But something happens here, and we'll see this tonight and in next week's Torah portion, that totally transform him. And Jacob goes from being just a simply guided person to a son of God, fully yielded, becomes Israel. So in, in chapter 32 now, I'm going to read 1 and 2. Now Jacob went on his way. The, excuse me. Yes, now as Jacob went on his way, the angel of the Lord met him. So the angel of Melachim, the messengers of God, met him. Jacob said when he saw them, saw the angels, this is God's camp. Singular, God. This is God's camp. So he named the place Mahaniam, which is plural for angels' camps. And that's, that's, that's what we have to remember. Now, how did it become known typically as dual camps or two camps? How did that come into being when it's not really, the word does not mean dual camps? It came into being because of the fact that right after this, Jacob divided his company into two camps. You know the story. He took someone here, someone there. He divided his into two companies, into two camps. So at some point in the history of studying the Torah, someone said, well, that's what it means. Mahaniam means two camps. No. I, I did everything I could to discover that in, in my concordance and lexicon. It's not there. The word there is Mahane, which is a camp, an army's camp, Mahane. And you put an im at the end of it, again, it's Mahaniam. So that's very important because, because of what I'm going to establish with you before we go next week. I'll carry this, this whole study further into an allegorical picture that, that, that concerns Israel and Jacob. I'm not going to do that tonight. But what I want to say to you tonight is that Mahaniam, angels' camps, is representative of something that involves us. And something that involves where we as believers in Messiah are today. It's relevant to us today. And I'll tell you why. Because what we're going to see next week is that Jacob is incredibly strengthened from this experience. He develops the courage and the determination to surrender himself. And we'll see that next week in chapter 32, 9 to 11. He surrenders himself. He yields. He finally yields to God in those, in those verses. And that begins the process that will ultimately take him down to the Jabbok where he'll come face to face with God. And he would have this transformative experience. Whatever happened at Mahaniam, and I can speculate, but whatever happened at Mahaniam completely bolstered his courage and his faith. And he went forward with determination and courage, came face to face with God, and became a prince with God. Why did he become a prince with God? Because he overcame. He struggled with God and he overcame. Next week we will look at this analogous picture as this relates to all of Israel. And it does. But Mahaniam is what we want to talk about. The camps of God's angels. It's an army camp. Right? That's, that's what it means. You go look it up yourself. There are a couple of words in Hebrew for camps. Mahaniam is referring to an army's camp. So what, is, what did Jacob see? He saw these camps, angels' camps, and he determined that this is God's camp. Why? Because the angels were reflecting the reality of God. The angels were, they were manifesting God. They must have been because he sees these camps, these angels' camps, and says, this is God's camp. This is where God is. He's among these angels. He's with these angels. He's in these angels. I want to submit to you, as it relates to next week's allegorical picture, Jacob being Israel, right at this pivotal moment, Israel is going down to the Jabbok. Israel is very much an Aramean right now, still trying to Aramean everyone and God, still is today. As it relates to this analogy that we'll look at next week, we, the church, the many churches, 
who will manifest God to Israel, who will bring the message of hope to Israel, we are Mahaniam. We are the camps of God's angel armies. God is in us. That's what Jacob saw. He saw these camps and he says, that's God's camp. God is there. So whenever we go up to Israel and we have these wonderful opportunities to speak faith, to speak courage, to speak hope into these people, that's what we're doing. We're being Mahaniam. We're messengers, aren't we? Okay, so let's do this. How many of us have gone to Kidumim and other places in Israel, Malay Amos, and know that God used you to speak a word that encouraged them? How many of us? Stephen, put up your hand. Okay, so we've, we've experienced it. You're, you're Mahaniam. Whenever that happens, you are messengers of God, and God is in you, and they see him. You have the potential to strengthen Israel, Yaakov. And only you have it. And there are many more like you that are poised and ready. And some are doing it. Some are doing it. We've done it. And there, there are others that are doing it better than us. And that's great. That's wonderful. It needs to happen more. Yaakov needs to see Mahaniem. Mahaniem. The camps. Where God is. And they need to take one look at the Mahaniem and say, God is there. That's God's camp. And folks, that happens. It happens. They see God in us. And they've reported it as such. Many times I've seen that reality, that dynamic, occur in them when they realize that God is with us. I've seen it over and over and over. And that's the effect of Mahaniam. What happens next? Jacob bolsters in faith. He bows up in faith and he's ready now to go down to the Jabbok. Is he afraid? Yes. Is the Aramean still pushing him back eastward? Yes. But he stands his ground, he struggles with God himself, and he overcomes. This is in Israel's future. And your word to Israel depends well, that reality depends on your word to Israel, is what I should say. And many more like you that will be courageous enough and bold enough to be that source of life and encouragement to Israel. Too many Christians want, want to kick the Jewish people and slam them over their heads with a Bible and damn them to hell. And I see it happening more and more on Facebook. This conflict in Israel is bringing out the rats. Yes, I mean that. Sounds, it sounds like a, a, a pejorative, but it's true. It is a pejorative, and I mean it. The rats in Christianity are coming out, and they're damning the people of Israel to hell. Not unexpected. Very much expected. You see, like I said on Sunday... It's the daughters of Babylon versus the daughters of Zion. Will the daughters of Zion take their position in the, in the earth today? Would they be the voice of God? Would they rejoice in what God is preparing to do? Or will the daughters of Babylon prevail? They will prevail to a certain point. The daughters of Babylon, I'm referring here as, according to the message, the daughters of today's Orthodox Christianity, the daughters of Babylon, are rearing up in the earth. And they're showing their ratty selves. Turning against Israel. Many of them, three weeks ago, four weeks ago, a month ago, were saying, I stand with Israel. Yeah. My church, we raise money for Israel. Sure we do. Now it's all about, you're going to hell, Israel, if you don't do things the way we do it. Because the pressure is on. The pressure to polarize to one pole or the next is on. And we're seeing it. I'll tell you something else and I'll bring this to a close. Concerning Mahaniam. Be in Mahaniam, the camps of God's armies, where his messengers are speaking 
and encouraging Israel isn't only relegated to Israel. No, it's, it's also relegated to those who will see and understand, those, will, to those who will hear and know. What I'm saying is, at this time, God is sifting the hearts of men. Remember that Israel is a plumb line. What does a plumb line do? Determines what's right and what's not. Who's right and who's wrong. Who's true and who's not. That's what a plumb line does. Israel is a plumb line that's being struck in the earth. And those who will recognize God's hand in what he's doing will be, will be true. Those that are not will definitely not be true. And that's what this plumb line is doing. It's creating what we call polarization. And that's happening rapidly. And you're going to see it more and more as this conflict continues to build. Today Israel received 24 hostages. They, they negotiated a, an Aramean deal for 24 hostages, right? Didn't trust God. Struck a deal. They're still Arameans. They're still Yahakov. Now, um, no, I don't want to. Do, I don't want to do this. No, no. Let's do it. <sighs> From the standpoint of faith, faith, because this is an issue of faith. This is not like standing up against COVID, where you just, you know, COVID is nothing. This is an issue of true faith. What would God want Israel to do right now? What would God want Yaakov to do in order for him to prove himself to be Israel? Follow his word carefully. Enter into this conflict with absolute conviction and faith. And God will deliver each hostage. He would. He absolutely would. So they're striking deals. They're Arameans today. And they'll keep doing this, and this war will drag out. It's going to get ridiculous. The media is going to make a mess of this. They've already made a mess of it. Israel is going to blunder as, it, as they go along. But you know what's going to happen, friends? God's light, God's purpose, God's hand will reflect regardless. There are already miracles that are occurring. And the Radi Christians are losing their minds. They're losing their minds they, 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 they are scared that God will show himself strong in the midst of Israel, but he is doing it and will do it even more. And the people who are true, according to that plumb line, will gravitate to God. Some of them are not even believers at this point, but they will become believers based on the reality of what they will see. That will happen. And God will draw to himself those who are true, according to that plumb line. That plumb line is the word of God. That plumb line is the word of God. The word of God is going to determine who is true and who is not. And I'm seeing it. I'm seeing it. One guy, one guy tried to assail me on Facebook last week. And he wanted to, he wanted to invite me onto his talk show where he can debate me and humiliate me about Israel because he, he knows all about Israel, how unfaithful Israel, Israel is and how, how wicked the Jews really are. You need to know this. He's a Christian, a minister of some sort. He, wanted to invite, he invited me, in fact, twice onto his talk show. He wanted to, to debate me and make me out to be a fool. I didn't even entertain him. At one point I said, well, I'll tell you what. I, in my mind, I didn't say it, but at one point I said, you know what, I'll invite him on to our show, and I'll go on to his show, see how that works. But I just I said, no, it's not even worth it, because there are many of them out there. So I spoke some truth to him. I challenged him about his lack of faith. I moved on. He kept squacking and squacking and squacking until he realized that he was being ignored, and he went on. But he's a rat. And what I mean by that, I want to define what a Christian rat is. He's ratting on Israel. He's turning on Israel. Just like many are doing it. Albeit, he was initially a champion of Israel. I'm pro-Israel. I'm in Israel. I go to Israel all the time to, 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 to encourage, to convert Jews, to encourage them, or whatever I do. He got rejected, and what happens? He becomes a rat. 
Now is his time to rampage. This is his time to rampage, as many others are doing right now. You see, it's like we've talked about before as it relates to Martin Luther. We have to be true to that plumb line. We have to be really true to that plumb line. But you will say, but wait a minute, guy, Martin Luther, he was the great reformer. Of course he was true to the plumb line. No, he wasn't. He was not true to the plumb line. He was true about justification by faith only. And he was right. But he was wrong about so many other things. We think of him as a great reformer. He only touched on one point, justification by faith. He missed about 20. He absolutely missed about 20 points of the Reformation that is going to happen. And that Reformation will happen. It is happening. A lot of the Reformation, the true Reformation, has to do with our position relative to Israel. That plumb line. That plumb line. Let me say this. Why do I say the Bible is the plumb line and Israel is the plumb line? You caught that, right? You're paying attention? You caught that. I said that Israel is the plumb line. Then I said the Bible is the plumb line. What am I, confused? No. The Bible is all about Israel. From the beginning to the end, Israel is God's vessel of light unto the nations. God established that. It is reiterated throughout the prophets over and over and over. The church, Messiah Jesus, we are the priesthood in the midst of Israel. It's God's construct. He designed this. The church, we have a responsibility in the midst of Israel. We are Mahaniam. We are the messengers to bolster them, to, 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 to manifest God to them, not to kick them in their tushes and stomp them with a Bible and damn them all to hell. What has that ever done? That, that's what Martin Luther did. Isn't it? Wonderful Martin Luther. Justification by faith. I'm going to take this essay. I'm going to nail it on that cathedral's door. Boom, boom, boom. Hamburg. All of a sudden, Germany is being transformed. Uh, France, Swiss, all over. People are being set free. And that's a wonderful thing. But when Martin Luther realized that the Jewish people of Hamburg and Germany were not going to accept his, his kind of gentle Christianity, what did he do? He turned on them, and he spoke death and destruction to the entire Jewish nation, and his disciple, his disciple, 400 years later, by the name of Adolf Hitler, decided to make right on what Martin Luther did. We need to be real about this. You want to know why Jews are so anti-Christian? What I just told you is just the tip of the iceberg as it relates to what we have done. Just the tip of the iceberg. We need to be real about this. But forget what the rats of Christianity has done. Forget about what they're doing now. Let's think about what we ought to do and the opportunities that are set before us. Mahaniam. Are you ready to be God's angel's army? His army of messengers. Not a war in this natural, but a war in the spirit realm. Are you ready for that? Are you willing to embrace that? Are you willing to, to kick the rats out? Are you ready to exterminate the rats from your life? And come into a place of being Mahaniam, being messengers to, to Israel. And to stand there and see the transformation in Israel. We'll see it. We will see it with our eyes. When God brings back Zion, that's what the psalm says. Let's read that psalm and we'll bring it to an end. I'll go to the beach and I'll continue to work. We will see this with our own eyes. Psalm 126. When the Lord brought back the captive ones of Zion, we were like those who dream. Then our mouth was filled with laughter and our tongue with joyful shouting. Then they said among the nations, the Lord has done great things for them, for Israel. 
The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. That's what we should be saying. That's for us to declare. The Lord has done great things for them. The Lord has done great things for us, and we are glad. So speaking to myself and speaking to you, I say, let the rats be rats. Speak to them if you have the opportunity. Speak truth to them. But let them go on. The only thing you can do is speak the truth, pray for those people, and let them go on. That's Babylon. That's the daughter of Babylon. And she's forming up real nicely in the world. You be the daughters of Zion. You be the, the messengers that you're supposed to be. And God's going to bless you. God's going to reward you. Your reward will be great. And that's the reality of, of, of where we are today. So let us, let us keep praying for the hostages, that Israel would, would muster up the faith and the courage to stand on God's word and to say we're here by the word of God in this land and these Philistines have done this, but God, who are these uncircumcised Philistines that they should do such a thing? And that Israel would be like King David, and he, when King David stood under that mulberry tree, or sycamore tree, which one? And he would not move until God has a, had shown him it was time to go. Let Israel be like King David and wait on that wind that will, that will illustrate that it, was, that it was time for them to go. By faith. And they will, they will accomplish great things. So pray for Israel's faith. Pray that they will have courage. Pray for Netanyahu and all of the leaders that they will refuse compromise and not acquiesce to this, to this government and to the world system. Because that's what's happening. That's what's happening right now. God, we thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to see the restoration of Zion. You've allowed us to see the return of your people to your land. And you've given us revelation. You've given us insight. Your word, Lord, you've allowed us to be true according to your plumb line. God, we ask that you would help us to become even more true and to reject every facet of the fallacies of Christianity, nominal Christianity, and let us embrace the Christianity of your son Yeshua and his disciples. Let us stand upon your word and not waver. God, we, we thank you, Lord, that you've done this incredible thing with us. and We owe our lives to you, Lord, but we want to serve you. We want to be Mahaniam, your messengers, your army in the midst of Israel. And we thank you, Lord, that you've allowed us to see these things. Use us for your glory, Father God, we pray in your son Yeshua. Amen. Shabbat Shalom.